All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the session about debugging dual ashes with Warshock. Uh, I'll first, um, uh, well, about me. I'm, I'm Warshock contributor since 2013. We came core a little bit later. Over time, worked on a lot of different things, uh, mostly related to TLS, which got me attracted to Wireshark in the first place. Uh, also, some Lua API extensions or things to uh, analyze capture trace with Lua, security and so on. And recently, a quick, uh, the quick transport and HP3 as well. Um, and during the day, I work uh, at Cloudflare within the research team. I also w work with, well, things related to cryptography, TLS, and so on. Um, you might have uh, seen Ross uh, talk yesterday also about TOS, which uh, provided uh, some uh, insight in the exact details of uh, the pro uh, TOS protocol. Uh, this session will be less in-depth to that. Uh, instead, I'll try to give you a high, high level overview of how to approach uh, analysis uh, involving TOS. And later on, I'll follow up with some examples. So whenever uh, you're doing something, well, not just with the computer, but in general, uh, if you uh, work on something, it's possible that something doesn't work as expected. You might get an error message or, uh, or application crashes or something like that. So as a very first step to debugging, you first have to describe exactly what the problem is. Um, so usually if you see an error for an application, it's, it's usually quite obvious that a problem exists. So it's possible that you miss that. So the very first step to deep debugging is actually observe and note, notice there's a problem. The next step is uh, once you identify there's a potential problem, uh, try to figure out how did you get to that exact problem. For example, by um, trying to uh, replicate what you were exactly doing, then perform the step and see whether the same issue occurs. So whether um, you, might, you might have expected no error message, for example, and instead the application shows an error. So by following those steps and ending at this result, um, you know, um, you, you should have a reasonable understanding of what's going on. And finally, when uh, writing all of these uh, things up, you, you should also describe the environment where this issue was occurring in. For example, the software versions, um, the operating system or uh, device in use. Um, all of these should uh, give you a very good start to, uh, to um, have a clear understanding of what the problem is and what the desirable solution looks like. So, yeah, usually when uh, I debug stuff, um, there are, they, there's, it's always following a similar pattern. First, I ident identify what uh, components are involved. For example, if I uh, used a curl, if, if I used a, um, a curl to reach out to a server, then it's, uh, um, the uh, curl is a client and well, the server uh, is not a host. But on the server side, there may be actually a lot of different components in between. As a user, you might not know, but as a Chrome developer, you might know there's uh, a couple of load balancers in between. Maybe there's a different, uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, like, yeah, bots between those uh, load balancers, for example or there's a database involved. And any of these components could potentially cause the issue you were observing. The documentation uh, and source code, uh, if available, is also usually a good place to look for, uh, for hints. Usually if I find an error message and the source code is available, um, I either use a search engine uh, to, well, to search the internet or just grab uh, the, the source code and then uh, search in the source tree for that error message. That provides me a context of where the error message is coming from. Um, it, the the uh, code where the error message is written, for example, it could have a very descriptive name or it could uh, show uh, the exact uh, um, code, the exact commands uh, 
that were executed prior to that error message. And it's also possible that uh, the, the misbehavior is actually mentioned in documentation. For example, maybe you, you, you forgot to configure something on the server side and it's actually documented that you should do it in a certain way. Uh, finally, there's uh, also application logs. So if the client, if you have a client and server application and the client doesn't um, provide very much information, you could uh, check, try to check the server logs or the logs for everything in between. For example, if you're using, um, if you're reaching out to an HP API endpoint, uh, it's it's possible that it goes directly to the server, or it could uh, go through a series of uh, proxy reverse proxy servers, and each of these could um, may potentially uh, maintain a log uh, log files or or something like that. Um, if the source code and documentation um, or the logs are not very helpful, you could also put, uh, try to uh, find a, a debug interface. Uh, this is very generic, but for a web browser, it could mean the developer uh, tools. Um, if you're using Firefox, for example, you could press F12 and then monitor the network uh, the network uh, traffic in there or the console for uh, things like JavaScript errors. For uh, web servers, it's, pos it's possible that a HP and an, a different HP endpoint is exposed through which you can get additional information or perhaps you can set a special header to get more information. Um, and uh, uh, apart from uh, those, um, well, in space, that you, it's also possible that the, the server itself provides a, a debug interface. You could potentially uh, connect remotely to the server through SSH or something like that, and then uh, reach out to uh, whatever in space is available. For example, if you have a de hardware device, maybe it exposes a serial device, a serial um, interface. If none of these uh, uh, work, it's uh, time to start observing the communication between the several components involved. Um, with a client server um, a system, it's, it's very easy to obtain a packet cap capture, and you can do it uh, anywhere in, in between. Um, usually for a user, it's, uh, the easiest way to do so is just to re record the traffic on the user's uh, own machine. But um, uh, if you're uh, managing the server or some, something in between, you could also set up any uh, capture point in there. So um, traffic, uh, traffic uh, uh, packet captures uh, help. Um, providing you exactly the content that were uh, communicated between hosts. Uh, to analyze that, uh, you could just open up in Wireshark, but there's, a, but there's an uh, issue with that. And most of the traffic nowadays is encrypted, either using uh, TLS, which is very common, um, SSH for yeah, things like um, rsync and um, uh, some management uh, tools, they all use the SSH uh, to, to connect to other hosts. And a newer thing that's coming up is Quick, uh, which is internally also using TOS. I'll show you an example of that later. So uh, if, if the traffic is not encrypted, uh, Wireshark would normally show you this is an HTTP request. Uh, and this is HP response or this is DNS query and so on. If it's encrypted, uh, all you will see it's uh, it's just random gibberish. A watcher can at most tell you it's TLS, for example, TLS application data. Uh, in order to hand handle, uh, ha to analyze such traffic, you could uh, try to enable login applications and avoid okay and avoid uh, uh, traffic uh, analysis altogether. Um, enable logging could be done by modifying a config file, or if you're a developer, you could do things like adding a, a, print, a print statement or, uh, or uh, add, uh, enable logging in the libraries that are used in, in uh, 
in the application. For example, in Python, if you use the request library to perform HP requests, the, the request library will normally print the uh, part that is being requested if you enable debug logging with logging dot, well, basic config level is the logging dot debug, for example. Another uh, alternative is to force uh, plain text to be visible in the traffic. So, well, for example, uh, once I had to do a, a, a load test with H2 load, uh, and it would, uh, in like 25% of the cases, it would uh, show, show an error. But H2 load didn't uh, show exactly the responses uh, from the server, except for the status code. In order to, uh, to analyze uh, these cases, um, I could simply use HP instead of HPS URL and it would still reproduce. So remember what I said before, if you have some steps to reproduce an expected uh, um, outcome and an actual outcome, uh, does, if you can modify those steps to reproduce and have a, have a, have a similar issue, um, just do, do it. It's much easier to, uh, to well, use what you already have rather than going through into a, a traffic uh, analysis of packet capture. If uh, if you cannot get the information this way, you could also try to decrypt the TLS traffic. And again, there are two approaches to that. You could extract a, a TLS secrets from the application um, or uh, use the server key, for example, and that would work uh, where you're only passively uh, capturing the traffic without modifying it. Another alternative is to actively intercept the TOS traffic, then uh, terminate it, and then re-establish a new TOS connection to uh, whatever destination you had in mind. Uh, that means that your interception point is able to see whatever traffic is in there, uh, but there's a disadvantage of this approach. Uh, if, if your problem is related to failure to establish connection, for example, or if, if, if your um, application is uh, sensitive to the uh, parameters that were in use in the TLS handshake, then, uh, then use of a TLS termination proxy could uh, influence the results. For example, if you have an, a client which performs certificate pinning, then use of a, a special TLS termination proxy would uh, uh, result in, in, in uh, a client seeing a different uh, server certificate. And uh, that could um, influence the result. For example, the client could detect there's an error or um, uh, the, the server change its behavior based on observed uh, 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 um, requests from the client. So that's uh, why you usually prefer a passive interception where the client uh, traffic is delivered to the destination access without any modification from the uh, debugging um, attempts. So generic approach to TLS decryption, you have to capture uh, packets, including the TLS handshake. Why is that? In the TLS handshake, the parameters for the TLS session are included. Uh, yesterday, Ross uh, showed a very extensive uh, outline of the TLS uh, key exchange, the different TLS versions uh, that can be negotiated, the ciphers and so on. All of these are present in the TLS uh, handshake. And without that information, Wireshark is not able to, uh, to decrypt the session. Um, this, related to this, uh, if you have a, a client which performs caching, like most browsers do, uh, try to disable the, the, the cache, either by flushing your cache or uh, um, um, going offline and then online again. Um, that's a bit uh, addition to that. Um, if you have an existing uh, browser open, the easiest way to ensure that uh, all, that the initial TLS handshake for new connections are captured is by closing uh, the browser and then restarting it. Uh, that will make sure that all connections closed and new uh, connections uh, are captured after they are started. Uh, I'll, I will um, talk a bit more about that later. So after capturing the packets, you also have to capture the TLS session secrets to enable decryption of it. 
like you said before. So in Wireshark, how would that work? If you start Wireshark, you first have to select a network interface. If you have, uh, normally if you open up Wireshark, you will see many interfaces. Uh, not all of them makes, uh, are useful, but make sure to capture the right traffic. You can use the, these uh, traffic uh, indicators to see which one actually have uh, traffic. For example, this is a virtual interface which had no traffic. And in this case, I had a, a VPN, uh, act, uh, active VPN connection. And uh, my traffic was normally routed over this uh, VPN. So I should make sure to select the VPN interface instead of my normal wireless uh, interface. After selecting the uh, interface, provide the, uh, you can opt optionally provide the capture filter. So if I'm if I would set up a filter right uh, a capture right now on my machine, uh, and not provide a filter, it would probably uh, capture all uh, my Zoom traffic, for example. That is uh, usually not desirable uh, first, most because your capture file grows very big and makes analysis uh, harder. It's not uh, very efficient. So uh, if you're doing an analysis, try to provide a filter such as uh, specifying a specific host. This would be resolved to uh, the IP address of this host by Warshock, and then um, it would only record traffic with those IP addresses. You can also use something like uh, uh, port 443, for example, or port 53 for DNS, and the syntax for these can be found in this uh, manual page. This is called the capture filter. It limits whatever is being captured by Warshock. Uh, after this, you can start the capture by pressing uh, Double clicking the interface or pressing Control E or Command E on Mac OS. For the secrets, uh, the, the, you there are there's a, a quite a, well a de facto standard called SL key lock file. The SL key lock file environment variable uh, influences many programs to uh, to um, uh, write uh, secrets to this to the file specified by this environment variable. This has to be set before starting an application because the application only read the environment variable at startup. Uh, yeah, then on, on for Firefox on Windows, you could uh, create a, a batch script this way. Uh, you set as a keylog file to the path and then start Firefox. Or you could create a shortcut. Um, uh, well, th this also works for, for Firefox. Uh, works for Chrome as well, but Chrome additionally has a special SL keylog file uh, option, which allows you to specify it. If you use this, then you don't have to worry about modifying this environment uh, variable. And for Linux and macOS, you can also have a one-liner where you provide the environment variable and an application. And usually when I uh, try to uh, create a reproducer of a problem, using Firefox, uh, I use, create a new fresh browser uh, browsing profile so that any keys I capture don't include my normal email or uh, other uh, sensitive uh, uh, details for my normal browsers, browsing session. Um, and I will show you a bit how this would look like on Windows. Uh, Hello, Windows. Windows dead. Um, oh, now it's active again. All right. So I have a. Um, in this case, I use PowerShell instead of uh, Batch, but similar, oh, similar uh, considerations, uh, considerations apply. In PowerShell, you can set an environment variable this way. Oops. I hope you can see it. Control. Anyway, um, dollar amp colon SLP log file equals quote, and then the path to, to the uh, key uh, key log file. And notice that it had to be an absolute path. Simply a relative path didn't work in some cases. Then in PowerShell, you have, if you want to execute an external application, you have to start it with 
uh, equals, uh, sorry, with the ampersand. And PWD refers to the current working directory. So if I open PowerShell now, uh, I have a branded script. But this probably do not work because of Windows issues. Scope process. Set execution policy dash scope process dash execution policy bypass. This allows me to execute PowerShell scripts in Windows for just a session. Now, if I uh, run it, I'll run a Chrome. No, run it. And a keylog file is being created. Not empty yet because I didn't visit anything. Um, the ah, so what I just demonstrated was how you can set the environment variable per per uh, well within a process that doesn't uh, affect all application on the system. If you have a virtual machine like I do here, and don't absolutely don't care about uh, recording secrets for traffic within this, you can go to system. Then oh, uh, this should be a way to modify environment variables somewhere here. Okay, just type environment variables in the start menu box. Is it environment? Ah, good trick. So right there, you could also specify new SL kilo file and then the path to your piece, for example. Uh, I'm not going to actually use, to use this because yeah, I have an alternative, but if you actually don't care about uh, logging all secrets on, on the system, you could use this approach. Uh, normally, I don't do this uh, since uh, on my uh, on machine I also have all other uh, sessions, uh, broad sessions running. I don't want to record my uh, e email, password, bank details, and so on. Mm. Oh yeah, and if you use this approach to uh, with a separate browsing profile. Uh, for Firefox, you have to make sure that the directory exists first. Uh, this uh, option, the SL kilo file uh, variable, it's also supported uh, by curl, uh, which is included with Ubuntu 18.04 and so on, starting with this version. If you are a developer uh, and you can modify the, the code, um, note that this feature has uh, well it was found to be useful, so many others has, have started implementing it as well. In Go, if you use the uh, 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 well, in Go, all TOS is normally handled by a, the Crypto TOS library. And if you uh, you might already have, you might have uh, seen the TOS.config structure, it has a member called Keylog Writer, which can point to a file. In this case, I use OS.st error to print to standard to a standard error, but you can also have some code that reads the SL keylog file environment variable, opens the file, and then provide it here. Uh, Python Python 3.8 also started also added support for the SL keylog file uh, environment variable, uh, but only if you use the default context. And Python applications can uh, well create. Uh, uh, SL connections, well, TOS connections in many different ways using the built in SL library. So it's not guaranteed that uh, in, in Python you would uh, be able to use SL kilo file environment variable, uh, read the documentation on this property. Uh, and Node.js uh, has a, sorry, the dash dash is missing here, but Node.js has a node dash dash TOS dash keylog uh, option which allows all JavaScript applications run through Node to log the secrets. Uh, both of these rely on the OpenSL library, which provides an API to control uh, logging of this, uh, but which provides an API to uh, extract the secrets 
from the JAWS library. Uh, there are some other OpenSL applications. Uh, if, if, you, if you are using older Python version or if you have some other uh, OpenSL application like HULOAD, where you would like to get a secret from, uh, there's also an approach using uh, an LD preload library, which can be injected in uh, Linux or macOS applications, or a, a trick using a debugger. Uh, I didn't show you yet what that file looks like. The, the key to text file that were writ was written, but it's a text file with a unique persistent secrets. Uh, this means that uh, the, the keys are only uh, usable to decrypt one particular session uh, with one step yet. But in general, it's sufficient to decrypt the, the, the whole TOS connection, the whole TOS session on one connection. In TOS 1.2, it's very simple. There's client random uh, followed by one identifier, which is the uh, ra uh, random field from the client hello message, followed by the actual secret. In TLS 1.3, this requires several secrets. Um, in TLS 1.3, every session has its own unique secret. In TLS 1.2, with session resumption, it's possible that the a master secret is being reused. So keep that in mind. If you have, uh, uh, even if you uh, kept your only uh, one, one, one session uh, plus this, uh, uh, plus this uh, a secret, it's possible that this secret can actually also be used to decrypt a, a different session, which was resumed using the secret from the first session. In TOS 1.3, this problem doesn't exist. Once you have that, uh, uh, that secret file, you can configure it in uh, Wireshark. Uh, to get to this menu, you can go to uh, Preferences. Oh. Let me actually open up Wireshark here. All right, let me just start with the demonstration. So let me first capture from, let's say, hostwireshark.org. Wireshark.org. So as you can see, there's some traffic here. Uh, I'll just capture everything on this interface. This file is empty. And let's say, uh, I like Firefox. Let me use Firefox. Chrome. Oh, Firefox. All right. Um, now, if you look at this file, it should be non empty. Oh, it should, it's empty because I didn't test it ending yet. Fine. Wireshark.org. Now it should be non empty. And yes, as you can see, it's all just 1.3 based on that I log uh, client and shape. There's also some TLS 1.2 session, uh, but yeah, I can now go to Wireshark. There's a lot of traffic here. I can stop this for now. So using the TLS uh, display filter, I can limit my traffic to well, TLS traffic. Uh, here I can see it's, It's uh, server, server name, Wireshark. So let me apply this as column. Uh, mo most uh, traffic has this uh, uh, SNI extension, the server name indication, um, except for, well, uh, let's assume that most traffic has this uh, field. So if you want to filter for Wireshark, you're going to also use uh, either TOS or, well, TOS contains uh, Wireshark, for example, and it would capture this traffic. So, was not tidy. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of application data here. It's all encrypted. Uh, if you look at this, it's all random cap gibberish. To configure the uh, kilo file, usually I right click on the TOS layer or anything below that, go to protocol preferences and then pre-master key log file. Here I can specify the key I just wrote. 
which is on my desktop right there, boost of 60. So after applying this, it should be decrypted. And yes, now I have a tab here called decrypted to us. Still looks like, well, not entirely random gibberish. It is my certificate. Uh, so this is what this was a part of the a client of the TOS handshake. Just the actual application data. Uh, let's see. Now I can use the filter HP2, for example. And here you can also see there were some style sheets in 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 uh, the capture file that was being recorded. So uh, that's how you can configure this. Uh, this key. Uh, if you use the G-Shock a command line tool, you can also specify this file using the uh, dash o tls dot keylog underscore file preference. Oh, I saw uh, some uh, questions. One of them is uh, whether certificate pinning is increasing. Um, as yes, no, so browsers stopped support for. For certificate pending, those extension uh, called H H two P some key pending something something header, uh, but this header uh, would make it too too likely to uh, to block um, uh, server operators. Uh, well, to it would make it too easy for server operators to uh, break their server for clients. So it was removed for from from web browsers. On um, on phones, I think the use of certificate pin is still well considered a, a useful mechanism by, uh, for example, banking apps. Uh, for other application, I'm not so sure. Uh, there's another question from Andre, from Andre: What display filter can be used to filter only TLS uh, 1.3? For example, the TLS dot record version equals uh, zero. Uh, X0303 matches to us 1.2 and 1.3. Yes, so um, if you look at this trace, this TOS trace, there's a, a record there. In TOS, uh, all, all messages are encapsulated in, in a, a record. Uh, the, the, the version right there, it's always, uh, well, TOS 1.2, even in case of TOS 1.3. The reason for that is this version means that uh, the the record layer is compatible with whatever TOS 1.2 defined. It's also considered the minimum uh, TOS version that's supported when used in the client hello. So in this client hello, you see uh, 1.0, which means the client at minimum speaks 1.0, and the maximum version uh, up into up to TOS 1.2 is included in client hello right there. Uh, you, you might wonder where does it specify TS1.3? Well, because uh, a lot of uh, uh, middle boxes simply broke when 1.3 was advertised here. TS1.3 used a different mechanism to negotiate uh, the use of uh, uh, TS1.3, which is called the supported versions extension. So in here, you, you notice the client advertised support for 1.2 and 1.3. And the, these others simply uh, are kind of ignored then. The client advice support for those versions, and then the server uh, agrees to the version. Again, not through this field. In, up to, to TOS 1.2, it would indeed be this would indeed be useful one point, for, for version negotiation, but uh, 1.3 used the supported version extension. And you will notice that Wireshark also uh, present the actually negotiate version in there. If uh, uh, the server hello and everything is missing, then Wireshark cannot really make a guess. So let me TOS or let me hide that server hello. Uh, ignore equals one. So if I ignore this packet, then Wireshark will not know that a server hello occurred. I would expect the pro to report the protocol version to be 1.2. Yeah. Because Wireshark had no, uh, don't know anything about the uh, actual negotiated version, it makes a best guess based on uh, this version. And if it knows the server, uh, hello, then it can report a more accurate version. 
Um, yeah, okay. Uh, don't. So that work. If you yeah, if you have any questions, yeah, feel free to leave it in the in the chat. Okay. So I showed you how to capture the traffic, how to get a secret from the application. Um, if you want to uh, distribute these uh, files to an analyst or some uh, other developer or someone else who could potentially help you, uh, having to, to to specify this uh, key all, every time is a bit annoying, which is why uh, Wireshark has an option to embed the keys in uh, PCAP and GFAL. Um, this was added in Wireshark 3, which was released already like a while ago. Um, it's only support for PCAP and GFALS. It it's not support for plain and PCAP files. Uh, you can use the edit cap command to inject these uh, secrets uh, using the dash dash inject dash secrets, JS comma, and then the file name, the input file, and then the output file. And to if there are any uh, existing secrets, it will simply be uh, appended to those. So if you want to replace secret, you have to use the dash dash discard dash all dash secrets option. And all of this is pretty hard to remember. So usually I uh, use my uh, inject that dash dash secret to buy script, uh, which, yeah, uh, which takes care of limiting, uh, limiting uh, extracting the minimal keys needed to decrypt this, uh, the uh, secret, to decrypt uh, the DR session in the file. So remember that uh, uh, if you set, for example, SL keylog file globally on your system, um, it might contain keys for unrelated sessions, which uh, could uh, make you vulnerable to uh, well, exposing sensitive data to others. So this script uh, looks for all uh, client hello messages in the capture file and extracts just the minimum needed to decrypt the secret. And this link to the file. At, at first I had a, a, only a shell script to perform this operation. Later on I uh, created Python version so that it also works on uh, Windows, for example. Another approach, if you don't uh, are not able to use the DOS keylog file, for example, for uh, there are many Windows applications that do not support this keylog file operation. Uh, uh, well, that do not provide access to the secret. That is, uh, there was someone who was able to use a uh, well. Most people would call it hacking, I guess, but uh, someone was able to use a, a debugger to to uh, get the secret from. Uh, from the internal library routines, but th that's usually not very uh, stable. Um, but so if you cannot use that, uh, but you do manage the server, you can configure Wireshark to use the server private key to decrypt uh, uh, stuff. Uh, advantage of the key log file is it's possible to decrypt all traffic after just configuring the private key once. The limitation is, well, you need to somehow confer, uh, to uh, convince the server admin to provide a key file. It doesn't work with uh, uh, forward secret ciphers such as uh, e ECDHA or DHC. Uh, it doesn't work with session resumption because um, the, uh, key the, during the key exchange, the, uh, uh, the uh, secret is encrypted with the RSA private key, but the key exchange doesn't happen if session resumption occurs. And it also doesn't work with TOS 1.3, which removes this uh, insecure uh, option. And also, if you manage to, to reveal this private key, if you accidentally leak this private key, then all previous and future traffic will be compromised because these ciphers are not for secret. Anyone with this private key can decrypt everything. Uh, okay. All right, and someone asked me. I will share the slides after the presentation. Oh, but I was, uh, I'll post it in the chat. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sh I sh share the slide after the presentation. So if you want uh, this uh, the script, uh, it will be available after. Uh, yeah. 
for, for some developers um, that are interested in it. Uh, this is an example of the Go, this is actually the, the Go standard library uh, where the, the key log file is being uh, written. So what I'm going to describe now is a ge generic approach that everyone, what the developers can use to get a secret. So uh, if you have uh, a TOS library, which uh, exposes the secrets uh, and some kind of identifier as, uh, in your library, you can have a, a debugger uh, um, intercept this function and then print whatever values are available in there. Uh, if, if I want to build, uh, if I, one, one problem is if you are um, you, if you are using applications uh, and trying to debug it, it's possible that you do not um, actually manage the, the source code for it. It's possible that some other team wrote the code for you to use, uh, and you have no idea where to start. Uh, and part of debugging is uh, finding a quick answer to your your problem with minimum effort necessary. So uh, one approach to, to that is if you are able to build the, the uh, Go application, for example, uh, you could modify the standard library and then simply uh, add uh, an override here if you do not want to trace every source code where and the key the, uh, the key of write can be overwritten. Another approach is to attach a debugger to this function and uh, on, the, on the stack, uh, uh, Everything is well pretty much available. The la the label such as uh, uh, client, uh, handshake uh, traffic secret, the actual identifier, and the actual uh, secret. And using debugger, you can uh, log off these. This is the approach I used uh, for debugging a uh, uh, an issue involving a, a Docker, uh, where I simply didn't want to rebuild the Docker because that would uh, if that's a quite a complex procedure. So instead of modifying the uh, source code, I, I just uh, use a debugger to get the secrets. So after uh, all these, using all these secrets, uh, note that when analyzing the traffic, it's possible that you still fail to uh, decrypt uh, or to properly recognize the traffic. Uh, Wireshark will try to reassemble uh, TCP uh, TCP uh, uh, segments, if possible, but it doesn't do that when the segments are out of order because that has some uh, effect on the memory usage, for example. If you uh, run into uh, TCP out of order packets you sh and you're pretty sure that all traffic is actually available, you have to enable the TCP protocol preference, allow sub to reassemble TCP segments and reassemble out of order segments. Uh, if you uh, have a, a non standard uh, port in use, you can also use uh, decode, uh, decode S to override the, uh, both the uh, transport uh, port, so TCP, for example, and the inner application inside. Uh, Wireshark detects TOS through uh, heuristics. Uh, yeah, if you have, for example, port 80, 80, which turns out to be TOS, you, you can use this to override it. Um, and the inner protocol is usually determined by the application layer protocol negotiation extension. So in this case, the client advertised that both HP2 and HP1 is supported. And in the server, well, in the encrypt extension for TOS 1.3, the this server agrees to use uh, HP2. Let me try to, um, let me try to, well, let me start with the uh, um, example involving Docker. Okay, so let's say, let's say I've been, oh, so um, what I'm going to show now is um, how to capture traffic from, from Docker uh, container. I should, okay. If you're normally capturing traffic from 
uh, from your, if you're running Docker locally, you can normally capture traffic on your uh, local machine uh, and will also capture the Docker traffic, but you still need to get the secret somehow from the container. So a way to do that. Um, So what I'm going to do now is I run a, a Docker container, for example, using Debian Buster, or oh, well, Alpine should also work. Uh, this sets an environment variable, this mounts a, a volume to my host. So my keys.txt is created. This is within the Docker container if I use, well, I'm on Mac and this is on Linux, so. Um, I could either run TCP dump within the, within the Docker container. Uh, yeah, let me try that actually. See here. The reason I would run TCP dump inside the container is because that's isolated from all the traffic. Mm, my dot. Hmm. I am. <laughs> okay. Okay. You have to create a file first before you can share it. Now I should have a my .pcap file and my keys file, both are empty. Install TCP dump and example curl. And my SL key log file, key log file sh should have been set. So now if I run curl, well, let's say I run TCP dump first. I can use curl. Uh, I don't care about the output. And both of my key files and capture files are written. And I can configure uh, using my nifty inject pcap in G script, in inject your, uh, your secret script to make sure that the keys are injected. Now I can open this up in Wireshark. Wireshark. Yeah, you can see the DNS query that curl tried and the HP2 query for example.com. Come to come in curl. Um, in this case, I'm using Docker. If you have an existing uh, Docker container, you can also well execute into the Docker container. For example, I don't have any, but you could use it. And this also works if you have an application running in Kubernetes. Uh, I'll stop there with Docker. Uh, quick. Uh, let me show an example with Quick and HP3. So, for those who don't not know, um, Quick is a is a recent transport uh, tr uh, protocol which is still being uh, uh, developed by uh, by the IETF, which is a standard uh, kind of a standards organization, but not quite. And uh, Google, Mozilla, and a lot of others are involved in in uh, de defining uh, this. Okay. 
where's my Python title? Oh, okay. Um, quick, there's a lot of participants. Um, Yeah, uh, Quick is a, just a transport protocol with many implementations work on it. Apple, uh, Cloudflare developed keys, and Chrome has their own implementation and so on. And it's not a standard yet, but it's uh, already, uh, it's deployed already um, uh, pro progressing. Uh, Quick is just a transport protocol replacing uh, kind of TCP and TOS together. Uh, it also has uh, encryption uh, built in. And on top of that, and um, normally you have something like HP or HP2 to transfer re HP requests. Uh, Quick uses HP3 instead. Uh, that's a very brief summary. I'll just uh, show you a capture because otherwise it might not make entirely sense. Uh, mm, then capture something with Wireshark. So uh, the status of uh, Quick and HP3 support in Wireshark, it's still um, it's still very much uh, in heavy development. A uh, Quick is reasonably supported. Uh, HP3 is still uh, very basic. It's it's uh, there's some basic frame uh, detection available, but uh, uh, actual support for headers and so on is still in development. So I'm just going to demonstrate what someone from Facebook built into Wireshark. It has not been merged yet, but it should eventually be be available. Uh, I'll use the nightly version of uh, Firefox. Uh, let's say Firefox H3. I think this was the way to provide arguments on macOS. So remote profile. I'm going to capture traffic using Wireshark. Of course. Oh, come on. Load it. It's fast. Okay, let's say uh, so who supports so Cloudflare supports HP3. Uh, let me capture from. So I will start Firefox nightly, which supports AP3 uh, using custom profile. Ah, that was not the right option. Wait, what? Oh, dash dash arcs. Okay. Open Firefox nightly. Uh, no, open Firefox. No. Okay, sorry for that typo. To reuse the existing Firefox, but create a new profile. All right, let's see if HP3 is enabled in Firefox. HP3 dot enabled. Yeah, that's enabled. Uh, now, if I go to cloudflare.com, it should show up in Wireshark. How does that look like? Well, there's a lot of traffic going on. Then we try to provide the keys to decrypt it. Uh, so how does HP3 then actually work? So in HP, uh, HP3 for is negotiated through a special header. Uh, so this, the, the very first request will still go over HP, uh, over um, normal HTTP, uh, HTTP using uh, using TOS over TCP. So you, you can see the initial request for that page. It's still over HTTP, TOS, and TCP. But due to its response containing the Alt SVC header, uh, Alt SVC. 
the client will recognize that ICLI HP3 draft 27 is supported over port 443, as well as draft 29 and some others. This, uh, makes, uh, this causes the client to attempt a HP3 uh, connection over quick. Five so, minutes to go, Peter. Thanks. Uh, um, Quick uses uh, the TLS uh, handshake protocol to negotiate its uh, security parameter. So in here, here you will recognize the familiar SNI extension from for cloudflare.com. Uh, Quick is always using a TLS 1.3. So that's um, mm, yeah. that's why we have a support version here with TLS 1.3, and also store some special parameters in the Quick transport parameters extension um, and then the server will similarly agree to use AP3 in this uh, using the ALPN extension. So remember briefly with AP2, it would say H2, it would agree on using H3. And if we go a little bit further, we should have H3. So, there's still quite a lot going on. Let me see if I have H3 in there. Ah, crap, uh, sorry. I'm supposed to have HP3 in there. Oh, is my capture still running? Capture, yes. So maybe this has quite a lot of sub resources. Maybe if I re reload, add more. To. That's all out. Expect HP3 traffic in there. Uh, why don't I see HP3 traffic? Hmm. All right, there's some work perhaps. In any case, uh, perhaps that sample didn't work. Maybe I, I, so, what I, what I do actually see here is I do see crypto frames which means there's some TLS uh, handshake going on. Actually, there are a lot of uh, TLS traffic uh, handshake going on, but I just don't see an HP3 message. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can quickly pull up an HP3 trace. At a previous Firefox nightly trace. Hopefully, that still works. Okay, so the protected payload, this should hopefully have HP3 inside. Great. So, HP3 works a bit differently. There are many, uh, so normally TCP creates separate connections, and there's no, and with HP2, you can have three multiplexing, meaning you can have. Use the same uh, TCP connection for different parallel requests. Uh, Quick is over UDP, uh, and we have well the familiar HP3 over Quick over UDP here. And you can also see uh, headers and so on. Again, it's in binary, so you need specialized tools such as Wireshark to decrypt it and uh, decrypt and recognize it. Uh, this has, so as you can see, this is um, this is kind of working. It's still work in progress. Later on, you should see HP3 uh, support coming to stable Wireshark. Um, then let me wrap it up. So yeah, as always, um, if you use if you want to decrypt stuff in Wireshark, use a keylog uh, file with the uh, TOS uh, secret inside, and distribute those secrets in a single PCAP and G file. Uh, for well, easy <laughs> distribution. Enable TCP re reassembly preferences to make sure that it works in most cases. And uh, the latest ver Wireshark version uh, should have the best results. Um, if, if you're working with Quick specifically, uh, there's a, a tools page, uh, the Quick Work Group based draft as a wiki with the tools page, which specifies which draft version is supported by which Wireshark version. 
uh, like I said, it's still an evolving thing. Uh, evolving uh, thing. It should be close to final, but yeah, you have to use a specific Wireshark version. And HP3 support, it's still in development. It's here it said not to support it. It has not been merged yet. Um, and if you want uh, uh, other uh, details on the actual handshake and so on, uh, you can have a look at my earlier presentation. Oh, it should be this one. All right, uh, that's uh, it for now. Uh, thank you all. If you have any questions, you can leave them in chat or email me or tweet me, whatever. Um, in the chat, uh, Jeff uh, mentioned, do you need to add a host www.cloudflare.com? Let me have a look. Oh yeah, pretty so. That's a good point. So briefly, I I guess I used to host cloudflare.com, but those may actually resolve to different IP addresses. So as you can see, they resolve to uh, different IP addresses. So if I capture, uh, the reason why in my uh, capture, I didn't see uh, the actual HP3 traffic that I was expecting, it's probably because some of the sub resources connect to a different host. So be careful if you are using uh, a packet kit, a filter like host. What I should probably have done is using something like uh, host uh, cloudflare.com or host to cloudflare.com. And since I'm interested in quick traffic, I could also use UDP port 443. Uh, quick don't have a standard port, but normally for HP3 purposes, most use port 43. Um, yeah. And if you have any yeah, feedback, please leave me in chat and elsewhere. There's another Q question there, Peter. On a server that handles thousands of connections, what's the best approach to identify a specific key? I presume this is an encryption key or a uh, on the surf, but so could you repeat the question, please? On a server that handles thousands of connections, what's the best approach to identify a specific key? So, if you have a surf with many connections, um, normally, normally you would use the uh, client random, the, the client hello to identify those secrets. So if you look at this uh, trace again, client hello, there's a, oh, this identify, this can be used to uh, match your keys to a particular connection. So if you have a server with a type of connections, and you somehow manage to capture all traffic, but in separate tracers, or uh, you can you can use, uh, use this key from the Kilo file to map it to a single connection. Um, if, you're, if you manage the server in sense that you actually, actually develop the uh, server, for example, using Go, you could also have a special condition in your Keylog writer a callback that uh, checks whether uh, the session is something you'd like to uh, capture and analyze. It, Another alternative is if you is uh, simply reach uh, isolate the traffic that you're interested in. Uh, if you have uh, well, a many server with load balance in front of it, you could try to configure the load balancer to direct a certain traffic to a single uh, machine, and then you use a capture filter to limit to a single client, for example. Hmm. Would that answer the question? Well, that's an answer. Um, and then there's another one there, Peter. When will Quick become more widespread? Currently, our firewalls block UDP 443 <clears throat> because the security devices cannot decrypt Quick for analysis. Uh, so Quick is already be uh, be uh, being become ad uh, adopted. Um, they actually, when talking about Quick, there are two uh, versions of it. So Google originally a developer version, which is commonly referred to as Google Quick. Uh, the, 
this this was an well, uh, this is being replaced by uh, the IDF uh, a quick version, and um, organizations such as Cloudflare uh, have already like uh, implemented uh, a quick on this on on the server side. Uh, Firefox and Chrome and many others have also implemented it on the uh, client side. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, it's already if if um, it's already uh, getting getting in use, and if you block uh, uh, quick. Right now, uh, the uh, operators, the server operators, and the client understand that it would simply break too much if uh, uh, if uh, there's no fallback plan. So, like like I showed before, how quick is uh, how HP3 over quick is negotiated is through uh, first establishing a standard HP2 connection, and then trying to reach out for for quick. Uh, to the, the quick port specified in the alt SVC header. Uh, let's see if we can still find it here. Alt SVC, yeah. So this means uh, try to connect to the same IP, but over port 43 and using a UDP. Mm -hmm. th this can be considered similar to uh, happy eyeballs. So for those who don't know, happy eyeballs is an algorithm that means that first, uh, if a host has both an IPv6 and IPv4 address, the client will first try to connect to IPv6, and then a little bit later, it will try to uh, establish a connection over uh, IPv4 as well. That way, there's a little latency, uh, but still the best protocol will be used. Uh, something similar will um, be the case for HP3. Uh, over quick, the clients will try to establish a quick connection if possible, and then send future requests over the connection. But otherwise, it will continue to use the existing HP2 connection. So yes, even if you do, it's not nice that you block uh, UDP port 43, but it should work in most cases. But then you won't benefit from advantage of uh, a quick. Okay, I think we've uh, cleared up all the questions now. Um, if nobody has anything else, Peter's given his contact details there. Um, he's usually around on various other forums, I, IRC and so on, and he'll be happy to answer questions for you. Thanks all for attending and have a nice shark fest.